praising God in difficult circumstances. When we are despised by those who resent our biblical values, we should not only pray for protection, but also for grace to praise God in the midst of these difficult circumstances. Here's Gene. Now, to understand this principle, we need to understand the context in which David was writing. And that's true of all the Psalms, isn't it? And we're able to really, in many uh, instances, to pinpoint the specific events that caused David to pen these words. And in this case, it relates to Saul, and it relates to his relationship uh, with, with David. It actually deals with Saul's intense jealousy. Now, before we just look at what we read here uh, in 1 Samuel 18, which gives the setting for this psalm, let us simply say that uh, the historical moment that led up to what's happening here was David's incredible victory over Gol of Goliath. And Saul was so impressed that eventually he put him in charge of all of his soldiers. And God blessed David. And notice what happened when God blessed David. What happened to Saul? Well, we read about it in 1 Samuel 18. And this gives us a setting, really, for this psalm. As they celebrated, that is, as the children of Israel celebrated, in this case, the women particularly, as they celebrated, the women sang, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. What happened? Well, you can predict what happened. Saul was furious, and he resented this song. And notice he quotes this statement that they were singing. They credited tens of thousands to David, he complained, but they only credited me with thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? And by the way, jealousy leads to paranoia. I mean, that's an overstatement. In other words, he's ready to take over my job simply because he's doing a good job and people are praising him. This is intense jealousy, and you see the results of that. And so we read, as a result, so Saul watched David jealously from that day forward. Now, the irony is that he brought David into his midst to minister to him because of all of his emotional issues and depression. And on one occasion, actually the second time it happened, Saul became very jealous and he took his spear and he tried to literally, while David was playing his harp and singing, tried to pin him to the wall, kill him. Well, David eluded Saul and he escaped that night and he went to his own home. And here's where we see what happened in uh, 1 Samuel 19, which again still sets the stage for this psalm. Verse 11 of chapter 19, 1 Samuel. Saul sent agents to David's house to watch for him and kill him in the morning. In other words, they weren't to go in the house and pull him out of bed and take his life. One reason was because Michael, his wife, was Saul's daughter, and I'm sure that he was trying to be somewhat protective. But he says, in the morning, I want you to get him when he tries to leave and kill him. But notice, his wife, Michael, warned David, if you don't escape tonight, you'll be dead tomorrow. And she knew what was happening. And I would suspect that Saul sent her a message telling her exactly what he was going to do to David, and then she needed to be careful. That's just speculation. But she knew somehow what was going to happen. So she lowered David from the window, and he fled and escaped. Now, this brings us to the psalm. That's the stage. That's the setting. And so in verse 1 of Psalm 59, we read, Deliver me from my enemies, my God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Now, let me insert at this point a bit of imagination, as it were. It's 
speculation, but I think it's very possible, and you'll see why in a moment from the text. But I can imagine David picking up his harp, and I can imagine him sitting down wherever he would sit, and he began to compose his psalm, and he began to sing in the presence of Michael. Deliver me from my enemies, my God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from those who practice sin. And save me from men of bloodshed. Lord, look, they set an ambush for me. And the fact is that Michael had shared what was going to happen. They set an ambush for me. Powerful men attacked me, but not because of any sin or rebellion of mine. I was simply doing what Saul asked me to do. I was actually singing for him. I was actually ministering to him. He tried to pin me to the wall. And then he ordered my death. But I don't think it stops there. I believe that part of his composition, as he's sitting there, and singing is his praise for deliverance. Notice, but I will sing of your strength and will joyfully proclaim your faithful love. When? In the morning. Now you see, there's a bit of evidence that he was still in his home when he composed this song. I will proclaim your faithful love in the morning. I know that you will deliver me. In the morning. For you have been a stronghold for me, a refuge in my day of trouble. To you, my strength, I sing praises because God is my stronghold, my faithful God. And there, I think he's literally ministering to his wife, Michael, as she's listening in to what he is saying. Then, of course, at some point in time, she lowered him out of the window, and he was able to escape. He's praising God in the midst of this very difficult situation. And as I was reflecting on David's experience, I couldn't help but think of an interesting story in the New Testament that correlates uh, with, with what happened to David. And this involves Paul and Silas. And they had been severely beaten and imprisoned in Philippi. Unjustly so. And they were in the inner stocks of that prison there in Philippi. And by the way, if you ever have the opportunity to go to Philippi, and as you go through that city, which is now just brick and stone and mortar, and you can actually see the excavated city as you walk through it, and at one point in time, they believe they have located this prison. And you literally can look in and see the cave in the side of the hill in which Paul and Silas may have been incarcerated, beaten, blood oozing down their backs. But notice what happened. There's prayer and praise and prison. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And I believe that perhaps that could have been happening to David as he was composing this song. For those who may have been listening, and it certainly could have involved more than Michael, it could have been their servants, could have been other people that were there in David's house. Because at that point in time, David was a pretty prominent guy in Israel and leading the king's army. And of course, you know the rest of the story. The earthquake that came, the chains fell off, all the prisoners the Philippian jailer was about to take his own life. Paul said, don't harm yourself. We're all here. And he fell at their feet. And he said, what must I do to be saved? And there, he is not saying, I don't believe. He's not saying, what can I be saved? Uh, what can I do to be saved from the, the Romans who are going to take my life because all of these prisoners uh, could have been released here by this, this earthquake. He's talking about salvation. He had heard enough from Paul and Silas, the preaching of the gospel. And so he's asking, what can I do to have eternal life? And I love the response. So they said, 
Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. And we read on that the jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because he had believed God with his entire household. And I think it's important to underscore, by the way, that his household wasn't saved because he believed. His household was saved because everyone in the household believed. It was a personal decision in response to the gospel that uh, Paul and Silas proclaimed once they went into the prison, he washed, or went into the, his home, they washed off the, the wounds and helped them. And there in that setting, that very wonderful setting, uh, they shared the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we see the end result of that incredible experience of praising God and prayer in the midst of difficulty. So here's a reflection and response question. How do we explain that some Christians are delivered from a martyr's death when they pray and praise God and others are not? And you know, I can't answer that question except to say God is sovereign. I cannot explain why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into that fiery furnace by the evil king Nebuchadnezzar because they wouldn't bow down to his image. They were saved, and yet other prophets were killed. I can't explain that. I cannot explain why James, the brother of John, was beheaded early on in the history of the church and John lived to be over 90. I can't explain that. I can only trust God in the situation. I cannot explain why Martin Luther wasn't killed because his life was threatened many times. And yet, William Tyndale, for translating the Bible into English, was burned at the stake. And his last prayer was, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. He died that we could have the Bible in our own language, English in this case. I can't explain that. Except to say that God is sovereign. And Paul acknowledged that when he was in prison the first time. When he wrote to the Philippians and said, I don't know whether I'm going to live or whether I'm going to die. But he said, I know I will be delivered. And that's one of the things that we really need to trust God for and we can trust God for, that no matter what, we will be delivered. Delivered to be free, to proclaim the gospel like Paul was for a period of time, or delivered into the presence of Jesus, which Paul said is far better. And when I read that, I I think, wow. I could just believe and hope that I would have that kind of faith in the midst of that kind of crisis, whether by life or by death, Paul said. Well, he went back to prison, as you know, and uh, the second time he was killed at the hands of evil Nero. So we need to trust God in these circumstances. So let's go back to the, the principle When we are despised by those who resent our biblical values, we should not only pray for protection, but also for grace to praise God in the midst of these difficult circumstances.